Welcome back, everyone. We are continuing to delve into God's Word in the uh, Old Testament and try to get an overview of uh, the one story that God was uh, trying to express to us throughout His Word. So last week we were in the book of Genesis, and this week we're picking up with uh, the book of Exodus. And so let's start in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your uh, inspired word and for all that we can learn about you through it. And Father, we just ask that you would help us to see uh, new things in your word today. And we ask all of this in your name. Amen. All right. First of all, uh, we are looking at the book of Exodus. And so we want to ask some basic questions to start, and that would be, who is the author? We mentioned last week that the author of the entire Pentateuch is traditionally uh, thought to be Moses. So let's put Moses down. And then we want to look at the type of writing that we're going to encounter in uh, the book of Exodus. And uh, mainly in this book, we're going to see narrative. And so this is going to follow very similar to what we saw in Genesis. Um, as a matter of fact, the form of the book of Exodus is going to be identical to what, what, what we saw in the book of Genesis. And so it's going to have two halves. The first half is the first 18 chapters. The second half is chapters 19 to 40. Uh, again, Genesis was split up like that in two halves. In the uh, Genesis account, we found that the two halves were joined together by a covenant promise that God made to Abraham. And that was key in the book of Genesis. Uh, God made a promise to Abraham. It wasn't dependent on anything that Abraham did. Uh, God was just going to do this. He was promising it to Abraham. And he promised uh, three main things. He promised that he would uh, make Abraham into a nation. Um, and then secondly, he promised that he was going to bless Abraham and he was going to give uh, that nation uh, that came from Abraham, the land that Abraham was living on at that time. And lastly, God promised that all the nations would be blessed uh, because of Abraham's family. Well, in the book of Exodus, we have a different covenant that's going to happen here, and this is a covenant that God makes with the people of Israel through Moses, and it happens on Mount Sinai, and uh, we'll be dealing, delving into that a little bit later, but what we've got is basically the same uh, structure that we saw in the book of Genesis. Uh, so what I'd like you to do right now is uh, to take a couple minutes, and you're going to pause the video, and uh, I want you to do what you did last week. Grab your Bibles, flip through the book of Exodus and um, take notice, write down kind of on a sheet of paper, what's familiar, what narrative accounts are familiar to you, what's not familiar to you. Uh, if your list looks anything like mine, you're going to be way more familiar with things that happened in the first half of Exodus than maybe some of the things in the second half of Exodus. But I want you to take a couple minutes pause the video and uh, flip through the book of Exodus, get it in your mind, uh, what's going on in that book. Uh, you got a couple minutes, pause it and let's go. All right, welcome back. Uh, hopefully you saw some things, oh yeah, I'm real familiar with these, and maybe you saw a few things that you weren't too familiar with, uh, and that's fine, something to go back to later on, but we want to look at uh, the book of Exodus, and as I said, 
Um, the first 18 chapters I was very familiar with. Um, this is where we find the Exodus story. Um, so let me just read to you how the book of Exodus starts out. It starts out like this. Uh, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, and Benjo Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. So when the Israelites went down to Egypt, they were 70 people. So already you see where God is uh, starting to make Abraham into a nation. But by the time we get to the beginning of this book, um, it says, uh, then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. And then in verse 8 it says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And here's where our uh, problem comes in. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. So, as we start out in Exodus, I wanted to uh, say one thing that we learn about God's plan. Uh, the first thing that we see is God is keeping his promise to make uh, Abraham uh, slash Israel a nation. When they went down to Egypt, 70 people. Uh, by the beginning of Exodus, Pharaoh is so concerned about how many Israelites are, there are, um, that he's going to deal shrewdly with them. And this is where the storyline starts to get interesting. Um, first off, I noticed uh, that uh, there's the story of baby Moses. Moses is going to be the main character in, well, God is the main character in Exodus in all of these uh, Old Testament books, but Moses is going to be a uh, primary main character in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. So he's going to be the biggie. Um, what happened was that Israel um, Pharaoh had ordered that all the babies born to Israel uh, were to be killed. And Moses' mother did not want her child killed. So the edict was that they were to be thrown into the Nile River. And she does put her son in the Nile, but uh, she puts him in the Nile in a basket. And God takes him uh, over to Pharaoh's uh, daughter, and he is raised in the palace. Um, when Moses gets to be older, he has an encounter with God at the burning bush. And this is where we uh, first start to see some things about God. And what we hear in this section is that God gives his name. And Moses asks God, well, who should I tell them is sending me? And um, God answers back, you can tell them I am who I am. I am sent, sent you. So God gives us 
uh, his name. And that's one of the things that I love about the uh, book of Exodus. There are a couple snippets in, in the, in the storyline where you actually get God talking about himself. Um, and that's just incredible that the God, God of the universe would tell us a little bit about himself. And so I find this very interesting. God's name is I am. He is always present. I am the present tense. So he is always present. And then it's I am who I am. And it's almost like God is saying, I am who I am. You may never fully understand me. Your human mind really can't grasp all that I am. But I am who I am. He is the creator. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God who made a covenant with them and is working towards keeping his promise. And so that's just, that, that was incredible to me, what, what we learned about God in the book of Exodus. We get to know his name. Um, then, uh, so God talks to Moses through the burning bush, tells him, you need to go back to Egypt, and I need you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. What ensues is basically a fight back and forth between um, Pharaoh, who believes he's a god, and the creator god of the universe, and... Uh, to put it short, Pharaoh loses. So uh, God sends 10 plagues that pretty much bring Egypt to their knees, especially the final plague, which is the death of the firstborn. Um, and then there is this dinner that happens called the Passover. Uh, yeah. The Passover. I know that we that the Passover um, is one of those things that uh, fits into what do we learn about God's plan? And this I love. Um, the Passover and everything that's happened in this list here is showing us that God rescues His people. So through this whole thing, uh, God has been fighting for the Israelites to get them out of slavery. They've been put into slavery by Pharaoh, and God is going to get them out. He's going to rescue them. Um, and that is just amazing to me because I see where it points to Jesus who is going to come and again God is going to rescue his people um, by sending Jesus to solve the sin problem. Last week in Genesis we had a, uh, a story about Abraham and he was told by God to go up on a mountain and sacrifice his son, his one and only son, which was Isaac, the child of the promise, who this whole nation of Israel was supposed to come from. It didn't make any sense to uh, Abraham why God would ask that. Not only that, but all the gods who lived in that area, the so-called gods, um, the, the people worshipped in, in that area, they all called for children's sacrifice, but not the God of Abraham, the creator God. He never wanted sacrifices of children. Um, and so this was just a, a very strange account that, that we get in the book of Genesis. And yet, God, when Abraham gets to the point of tying his son down and he's got his knife and he's ready to go through with it. He's trusting God. He's having faith, which we talked about last week. God says, Abraham, don't do it. There's a ram over there in the thicket. 
and the ram was the substitute. Now, over here in the book of Exodus, we have this plague that's coming where the firstborn of every household is going to die. That's what the plague is that's coming. And um, God tells his people to kill a lamb, not a ram, but a lamb, kill a ram, take its blood, put it on the doorpost of your house. And when the death angel comes through, he will pass over you if he sees the blood of the lamb. That's interesting because that's a lot like the substitution that happened back in the book of Genesis. Now we've got a lamb that is going to be sacrificed, killed, put the blood put on the doorposts, and it's going to take the place of the firstborn. The firstborn will not be killed. Interesting here that... Uh, this whole thing, the ram that was substituted for Isaac and the lamb that was substituted uh, for, you know, the getting the death angel to pass over, they both point to what Jesus is going to do on the cross. He's going to die in my place. He's going to die for my sins. He's going to die for your sins. He's going to die for the sins of everyone on the planet. So already in the book of Genesis and the book of Exodus, we're getting foreshadowings of what's going to happen in the New Testament. Very cool. That's fingerprints of God that, that, that we can see there. All right, well, back to the Exodus story. Um, Pharaoh finally says, fine, your people can go, get out of here. Um, God moves with them as a pillar of fire um, by night and a pillar of cloud by day. They get down to the Red Sea. Pharaoh decides that he's going to come and he's going to uh, kill them all. And um, God ends up parting the Red Sea, the Israelites walk through on dry ground. Huge miracle. And then um, uh, when, the Is when the Egyptians come through to, uh, to destroy the Israelites, the Red Sea goes back into place and destroys the entire Egyptian army. Later on, once they get on the other side, uh, we see that God is going to feed them in the wilderness, the desert, uh, by providing manna and quail. And that brings us to uh, this covenant in Exodus chapter 19. But before we get there, I wanted to mention another thing that I noticed about what we learn about God through this uh, book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, God is... Powerful. God is powerful. Um, there are some books where they portray God as God was in the whisper. Or maybe a book like Esther where God's not mentioned at all, but you just kind of see how he's moving through the book. Well, that's not Exodus. In Exodus, God is large and in charge. He is sending plagues. He's sending a death angel. He's in the pillar of fire and cloud. He parts the Red Sea. He brings it back in to destroy the uh, Egyptian army. He's miraculously feeding the Israelites. We see over and over throughout the book of Exodus that God is a powerful God. And one more thing that, that we see about God in the book of Exodus is that God is compassionate. God takes care of them. Um, you know, here are these 
Israelites, they're in the land of Egypt. They've been put into slavery. They cry out to God for help, and God hears them. Um, he uh, takes care of them. He gets them out of Egypt. He brings them through the wilderness. He feeds them. He's taking care of his people. He is a compassionate God. Well, we get to the covenant, uh, which is what the, the, the hinge between the two halves of Exodus. In chapter 19, uh, the Israelites have made it to Mount Sinai. Uh, Mount Sinai, you've got a big cloud at the top of it, thunder, the ground is shaking. Another example of how powerful God is because God has shown up on the top of Mount Sinai. And nobody wants to go up there, and Moses ends up going up. He is given uh, the covenant, the, the, the laws that, um, uh, that God wants the Israelites to keep. This covenant that we see in chapter 19 of Exodus is different from the one that we saw uh, in the book of uh, Genesis. It's different in that the Abrahamic covenant had no uh, contingencies. It wasn't an if-then kind of thing. It was God promising that he was going to do that no matter what Abraham did. In this covenant uh, that, that Moses gets, it's God saying, I'm going to do these things, but you have to keep my covenant, which are the Ten Commandments plus a bunch of others, 613 laws. Well, let me see if I can't find this in Genesis chapter 19 and read it to you. What God says. He says, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, here comes the covenant. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, these laws that he's going to give, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So, God is giving another covenant, and he's saying that if the people of Israel keep the law that he's giving through Moses, then they will be a holy nation. They'll be his people. And that uh, really goes back to Genesis, where um, Oh, it goes back to Genesis and creation. There we go. God said, um, God created mankind to walk with him, to have fellowship with him. And it says in Genesis that God made man in image, which means that when uh, Adam and Eve stepped out, they were representing God. Uh, that creation could look at them and see somehow God, a reflection of God. Um, and, of course, when Adam and Eve sinned, that whole situation uh, was destroyed. Sin does not reflect God. Sin is disobedience to God. Um, but here, God is saying to the people of Israel, if you do these, if you keep these commands, this covenant, 
then you're going to be my representatives to the world around you. God wanted Israel to do what Adam and Eve were supposed to do. He wanted Israel to represent him to a sinful world. And they were going to do that by living according to his uh, laws and being in a relationship with their God. And then the nations around them would say, oh, wow, we want to know how we could uh, be like you and have a relationship with God and be blessed and, and all of that. So this is really referring back to the Garden of Eden, which brings us to the last section of Exodus, and that is the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a tent but it was a tent where God was going to dwell. And in Exodus, there are chapters and chapters of instructions on how to build this tabernacle where God is going to dwell. Again, this is referring back to Genesis. Uh, God had designed Adam and Eve to walk and be in communion with him, to have a relationship with him. He and Adam and Eve were going to be together, walk together in the cool of the evening. Well, sin, of course, destroyed all of that. And now we see where God is uh, starting to move into a, a realm where he'll be able to live in and among his people again. He'll be in the tabernacle. And so um, we want to, what do we learn about God's plan? Uh, number three, God wants to be with his people. We said last time in Genesis that God loves us and he wants that fellowship with his people. And uh, so here we see God is setting it up so that he will be able to be in the tabernacle and the Israelites will all be around. And um, so that was another very interesting thing that, that, that we see. Another fingerprint uh, pointing to the New Testament because God wants to be with his people and you're going to come up with the tabernacle. Later on, they're going to have the temple. But in the New Testament, after Jesus leaves, the Holy Spirit is sent. The third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is sent. And he doesn't live in a tabernacle and he doesn't live in a in a temple made of human hands. We're told in the New Testament that God is with his people today because he's living inside of us. The Holy Spirit is inside of us. And so again, here's the Old Testament. Um, you know, Genesis, Adam and Eve walking with God in the garden. That got destroyed. So God goes with a tabernacle. He's going to be with his people, which then becomes a temple. He's going to be with his people. But when we get to the New Testament, he's going to be inside of us. The Holy Spirit is empowering us. Uh, it's guiding us what we should and shouldn't do. Uh, our conscience is tied into all of that. But um, yeah, God wants to be with his people. And so you're already seeing where the first two books are pointing to what's going to happen in the New Testament. So how should all this change how I live my life? Well, as I was reading through the book of Exodus, I noticed that, uh, yeah, there were some great things going on. There were. But you also saw, saw where the Israelites complained. God had rescued them, taken them out of the land of Egypt, and here they were in the wilderness, who's better back in the land of Egypt? 
God provides food, manna for them, and they complain about it. They complain about uh, the manna that God provides. Whew, I think the biggest thing that I got out of how this needs to impact my life is I need to stop complaining. And I need to trust God. Abraham was able to trust God, and Moses was able to trust God. The Israelites had a little more problem. Uh, so, yeah, as I read through, I kept thinking, I want to be more like Abraham. I want to be more like Moses. I don't want to complain. I, I want to trust God. He's got a plan. And uh, he is powerful and compassionate, and he loves us. He wants a relationship with us. Um, am I taking time in my life to build that relationship, to spend time with the creator God, uh, with the all-powerful God of the universe? Am I making the time or am I just too busy? And am I getting into this issue of complaining uh, too much when God has provided so much and trusting him. Well, those are some of the things that I hope uh, you, learn, you, you saw in the book of Exodus. They are uh, some of the things that I learned this week. Um, next week is a big one. Uh, we're going to be looking at the book of Leviticus and Numbers. and Deuteronomy. Now, I know that that's a tall order. Um, so do the best that you can. Uh, flip through those books. Read through those books if you've got time. Read passages out of those books. Maybe flip through them, see what's familiar, and read through what's not. Um, however you're going to do that, uh, but make sure that you're looking at the book of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy for next week. Uh, the other thing is make sure that you click those um, video links below this uh, video because they are links to the Bible Project. And uh, the first one is the first half of Exodus. And the second one is the second half of Exodus. And they are just, they, they go into so much more depth than I can do here. And they draw way better than I could ever hope to draw. So I would really encourage you to uh, click those links down below this video so that you can enjoy uh, the Bible project. I, 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 I've learned so much from them and you're gonna see that Quite a bit of what, what we're talking about leans into what they've uh, explained through their videos. So make sure you take advantage of those. Uh, let's have a word of prayer and then uh, you can head on out and have a great week. Father God, we just thank you. Uh, Lord, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit. Uh, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is our teacher. And Father, we have your word and we have the Holy Spirit inside of us as our teacher. And so, Father, we just ask that you would allow your Holy Spirit to speak to us and to teach us and to show us the things that we need to see in the Old Testament. Uh, the books that we're looking at for next week, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, they are some of the least read books in the Old Testament. And so, Father, help, help us not to fluff it off, but to dig into this with the Holy Spirit as our teacher. And we look forward to coming together next week to uh, talk about what, what we've learned. And so we ask you to just bless our weeks. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. Next week, Leviticus Numbers and Deuteronomy. We will see you then.